I'm Professor Alviso, and welcome to World Music. Before we begin our study of world music, we should acquaint ourselves with some philosophical and practical reasons for doing so. The first few chapters of your book, chapters 1 through 3, will provide you with some of the tools for learning about music, talking about music, and talking about culture before we travel to the particular locations. Ultimately, your appreciation of the musics we study will depend on your motivation, previous, con uh, previous contact, and your individual interest. The readings from your textbook are your primary resource, but these video lectures will highlight the key ideas and oftentimes add new information not found in the book. If you have any questions at any time, don't forget to reach out to me. I look forward to having a great class with you. A basic definition found in early editions of various dictionaries usually goes like this. Music is beautiful sounds. As beauty is in the eye of the beholder, this definition is obviously quite subjective. What is music to one person may sound like noise to another. A heavy metal thrash band may sound good to you, but your parents may not feel the same. An Indian classical musician, for example, may describe a performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony as a wall of sound, i.e. noise, in comparison to his own musical traditions. What we think of as music versus noise is largely based on our cultural background. One suggested definition of music is, music is an individual cognitive perception of organized sound and silence. We must perceive a sound, then have to individually interpret those sounds as being organized in a way we recognize as music. If not, we can consider it noise. However, the beauty of learning about world music is recognizing that our cultural background has determined this cognitive perspective. Thus, we can hear a sound that we initially consider noise and recognize that of a different cultural perspective, those sounds may be interpreted as music. A basic credo of ethnomusicology is, music is universal, but not a universal language. This basically sums up our previous discussion. Meaning in music is individually interpreted and culturally relative. When the Olympics come around again, watch the victors of a competition on the podium. When the gold medalist national anthem is played, how do they react different than the silver and bronze medalists? Oftentimes the sound of their national anthem will hit the winner and you will see tears of joy, whereas the others, certainly happy, will not feel the same sense of emotion, and not just because they got second or third place. You may recognize the national anthem of another country as music, but the sense of national pride that those sounds evoke will not affect you the same way as a citizen of that place. The music holds a different cultural meaning for a native versus non-native of the represented country. Throughout this course, we will study a variety of traditions that you will often interpret as music, but other times consider as noise. Our underlying objective is to appreciate the cultural perspective of the people who create these sounds so that we have a better understanding of what the music means to them. Ethnocentrism is a dirty word in cultural studies but it need not be. It's a fact, we're all ethnocentric. This is unavoidable. Being aware of our cultural biases is an important first step toward appreciating someone else's perspective. So, listen with an open mind and awareness that our intent is not necessarily to enjoy everything we listen to in this class, but to appreciate its value. Finally, review the discussion of folk versus classical versus popular music in your book. For the most part, we will be examining traditions considered as either folk or classical, though we'll occasionally touch on a few popular traditions, such as reggae music from Jamaica as well. Many of the folk and classical traditions were once the popular music of a region, but today we recognize the latter as music primarily associated with the music business and mass media. Folk music is generally learned through informal means, while classical music requires years of formal training. When you look at the term ethnomusicology and take it apart, you may think that is, it is the study of ethnic music, 
but ethno actually means people. It's the study of music and people, or more specifically, the study of music as culture. All music is of the world, so we could just as easily say musicology, but that label is generally reserved for scholars of the Euro-American art music tradition, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, classical music of the Western world. Nevertheless, both musicologists and ethnomusicologists alike utilize a basic four-step process with regards to their scholarly research. These steps include preparation, fieldwork, analysis, and dissemination. For ethnomusicologists, fieldwork, a term borrowed from anthropology, usually requires them to travel somewhere in order to study the music firsthand. For musicologists, or I should say most musicologists, their field work is more often in the library searching for empirical evidence, such as a book or manuscript, that can be used to support their research. Once the data is collected, the researcher then analyzes and interprets his or her findings. The final task is to share it with others. Certainly a scholar does research to feed his own curiosity, but disseminating what he or she has learned is important so that others can benefit from their work. Writing books, producing audio recordings, presenting papers, performing and promoting concerts, organizing community events such as a festival, teaching, and even publishing material on the web are all valuable means of disseminating knowledge. Finally, it's important to know that there is no canon of world music. Ethnomusicologists stress that all music is equal but different. Yet, we recognize that it is not feasible to study every music tradition in the world. So, we necessarily select those that are of interest to us as individual teachers. Furthermore, while your book includes representative examples of many different traditions, encapsulating an entire culture's music product into just one or two excerpts is quite ridiculous. To illustrate this point, let's suppose I ask you to choose just one audio example to represent all of American music. What would you choose? Jazz? Rock and roll? Bluegrass? Classical? Gospel? There are numerous genres and thousands of examples you can pick, but boiling American music down to just one example can't represent the entire musical soundscape. The same is true of everything we study in this course. We'll only scratch the surface. So if you find some music you like, I encourage you to learn more about it on your own. While you will learn much in this course about world music, there is much, much more to explore. Every sound has an aural color determined by its medium. Even two identical instruments do not have the exact same timbre. An amateur pianist can distinguish between a bright piano versus a dark piano. A professional pianist can tell an upright piano from a grand piano with ease. Identifying the medium of what you hear is often enough to know where a tradition originates. Some traditions only use voice. Others are always small instrumental ensembles. Familiarizing yourself with the timbre of voices and instruments can go a long way in helping you to visualize and discuss the traditions. It takes repeated listening in most cases, so don't expect to distinguish between a sitar and a pipa right away. Being able to do so, however, can tell you immediately whether you're listening to music from India or China and lead you to a great many cultural associations. So, after assessing your first impression of a new music, focus on the medium. Keep it simple. Do you just hear voices, just instruments, or a combination of both? How many musicians are performing? Just one, a few, or are there too many to count? With voices, there are two basic categories, male and female. You can further divide these into upper and lower female as well as upper and lower male. Western art music has many such sub subcategories, such as soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. But these terms are not always useful in discussing world music. With instruments, Visualizing an instrument based on timbre becomes much more challenging. Some ethnomusicologists specialize in instruments rather than musical traditions as their focus of research. This subdiscipline is known as organology, which is the study of musical instruments. In the Euro-American art music tradition, 
organologists classify instruments largely based on materials, that is, strings, woodwinds, brass, percussion, and keyboards. Ethnomusicologists have a different system for classifying instruments, usually referred to as the sox hornbostel system. The determining factor for the categorization of an instrument in this system is based on what part of the instrument vibrates to produce the sound waves. The more discreetly you can subcategorize an instrument, the easier it is to visualize it once heard. The basic categories are aerophone, chordophone, idiophone, and membranophone. Electrophones have been added in the modern era, era, but we won't be dealing with many of them in this course. Chordophones present a good example of how subclassifying an instrument can help you visualize it. I've listed three different kinds of chordophones there on your slide, lutes, harps, and zithers. Visually, a zither has no neck. The uh, strings are parallel to the ground, as in the example of the seated man there. Versus lutes, which have a neck, some can be bowed, some can be plucked, some have frets, some have no frets, and harps, where instead of being parallel to the ground like zithers, the strings are perpendicular to the ground. Zithers tend to utilize a larger resonating body than some of these other instruments, giving it a more reverberant timbre than a lute. Think of the difference in decay rate of a piano, which is a zither, versus a guitar, which is a lute. The sound of a guitar fades much more quickly than that of a piano because its resonating body is much smaller. Timbre is also affected by the way an instrument is played. A bowed lute has a smooth timbre as the string vibrates continuously while the musician pulls the bow across the string. A plucked or strucked instrument, in contrast, has more of a roll to it as the musician must repeatedly pluck or strike the string to maintain the sound at a consistent volume level. Another key factor associated with timbre on chordophones is the presence of frets, which are small bars placed under the strings to help with a proper pitch production. A musician who plays a fretless chordophone can slide between pitches by moving his or her finger up and down the string, whereas a similar technique on a fretted instrument is impossible. So compare the following examples and see if you can distinguish which are lutes or zithers or harps based on how they are played. In chapter 5, listen to the sarod. Chapter 13, blues guitar. Chapter 7, Gujang, and Chapter 8, Santur. Aerophones are instruments that require a column of air to produce the sound. The three basic types are flutes, reeds, and trumpets. A flute splits a column of air on an edge to produce sound. A reed aerophone has a reed made from materials such as bamboo, palm leaves, cane, or even plastic that vibrates to create the sound wave. A trumpet is a sort of a human reed instrument in that the musician must buzz or flap their lips together to create the sound wave. Compare the following audio examples from your textbook audio as an introduction to the differences in timbre between these types of instruments. Flutes, chapter 13, Native American flute. Reeds, Chapter 9, The Irish Ilian Pipes. And Trumpets, Chapter 4, Australian Didgeridoo. The left picture on this slide is a transverse flute, meaning it is held horizontally. A quadruple reed aerophone, meaning there are four layers of material that form the reed. And ivory tusk trumpets, pictured on the right. Membranophones are in most cases a drum of some sort. Drummers often have a keen sense of unique timbres they can produce from their instrument, but for the uninitiated, the ability to at least tell the difference between a drumstick from a hand and one played with a stick or other device is useful. 
Compare Hand Membranophone, Chapter 5, Raga, Tabla, pictured on the left, and A Stick Membranophone, Chapter 10, The Talking Drum, Atumpam, pictured in the middle. A friction drum, as with the quika heard in the samba example, is considered a rubbed membranophone. Generally, a stick passes through a membrane face and then is moved back and forth, causing the membrane to vibrate. Such instruments often have a squeaky sound that is easily recognizable. Lastly, the one type of instrument in this category not considered a drum is a singing membranophone, such as a kazoo. The membrane vibrates to produce the sound, but it is not struck or rubbed with another device. Some ethnomusicologists consider such instruments as an aerophone, but the vibrating membrane is the essential feature, thus making it a membranophone. Finally, idiophones are perhaps the most diverse type of instruments with regards to timbre. The term percussion used in the Euro-American art music tradition includes this category, as well as membranophones, but ethnomusicologists separate these two categories. Idio means self. So basically an idiophone is an instrument that is itself vibrating to produce the sound waves. A pair of crashing cymbals is a good example. You can typically see and feel the cymbals vibrating after striking them together. As soon as the cymbals stop vibrating, the sound stops. Idiophones can be divided into two different categories, melodic or rhythmic instruments. Melodic idiophones have a singable, singable definite pitch, such as a xylophone, and are most often used to play melody. Rhythmic idiophones generally have an indefinite pitch that can at least be imitated, such as a rattle rather than sung. The matter of performance can also affect the timbre. Plucked, struck, or shaken are three basic divisions you can use to help visualize the idiophones you hear. Some examples to note on your CDs include Chapter 10, Embira. Chapter 10, also, Akadinda. That is the, uh, uh, the xylophone pictured there on your screen. And Chapter 7, Beijing Opera, or Tibetan Ritual, the symbols pictured next to the xylophone. Texture is the layers of sound in a piece of music and how those layers relate to one another. Normally, we're focusing on melody, chords, or rhythm when we're listening for texture. The simplest texture is when there is only one line of music. That texture is monophonic, one sound. That's for one melody or one line of music. On the other hand, when you have multiple, independent, equally interesting lines of music or melodies, that texture is known as polyphonic. Think of a Bach fugue, for example. Homophonic music is the music you're most used to listening to. It's where there's one main melody accompanied by chords. Heterophonic music is usually associated with Asian traditions and is actually the most common texture in the world. Before the advent of chords and the acceptance of chords in the East, if you had a Chinese orchestra of say 200 musicians, each one of them would be playing the same basic melody, but each instrumentalist would be altering their version of the melody with different ornaments and different rhythmic variation. So heterophonic is one basic melody played by two or more instruments or voices, each with their own different ornamentation and rhythm. Polyrhythmic is easy to hear. That's where you have many layers of rhythm, such as in an African drum ensemble. So polyphonic, many layers of melody. Polyrhythmic, many layers of rhythm. Next. Let's talk about some terms referring to rhythm. Rhythm is the sounds and silences in a piece of music. 
You can have free rhythm where there's no regular pulse or beat, or you can have music with a pulse or beat. When there is some kind of regular pulsation to the music, you can also usually, I'd say 99% of the time, organize those beats into regular groups. The most common meter or organization of beats into regular groups is duple meter and triple meter. These are meters where you can usually count, for instance, duple in one, two, one, two, or could be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, is still a version of duple meter. Versus triple meter, that sounds more like this, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. As we study world music, you'll find that many cultures have much more complex meters than you're used to in Western music. It's not unusual for dancers and musicians in a Greek ensemble to be performing in seven, where you have one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. Tempo is basically the speed of music, and that's a term that you're already familiar with. Some of these terms are a review for some of you. For instance, many of you already know that the term for volume in music is dynamics. Form is the organization of musical ideas in time. So for instance, if you have a simple melody and it repeats, and then there's a new melody, the form of that would be A, A, B. Finally, there are many aspects of a musical tradition that give it meaning. These extra musical associations, essentially the relationship of music to non-musical phenomena, for example, history, religion, politics, other art forms, etc., are often helpful in identifying a tradition as well, and are certainly important for comprehending the meaning of the music in its cultural context. Technology has been an important contribution to our understanding of world music. Bringing equipment into the field has become increasingly easier through the past century. This has enabled wider dissemination of music and culture throughout the globe via recordings, satellite TV, the internet, etc. It's also become increasingly important to the development of traditions themselves, particularly as some genres evolve into the sphere of popular world music. Related art forms such as theater, dance, even visual arts are often affected by musical practices. These other art forms provide varying contexts for music transmission. Books are not by any means the only way to learn about your cultural history. Musical performances are often a primary method for transmitting social and moral codes from one generation to the next, particularly when combined with other artistic endeavors. Pedagogy refers to the methods of teaching. While the Western world places great emphasis on empirical evidence, that is books as the primary source of knowledge, other cultures rely on people to transmit this information. In many world music traditions, teaching through oral means rather than written is the main method of learning. Notation. Nevertheless, there are many traditions in which a script is used to represent musical sounds. Whereas Western musicians generally interpret notation as an exact representation of musical sound, most other traditions use notation as a point of departure or merely as a reminder of the main musical elements. This is akin to, as, to how, for instance, a jazz musician may improvise on a written melody. Tibetan notation, as an example, is more like this latter conception, reminding the performance performer of the general melodic contour, but not necessarily prescribing the exact pitches to use. Exchange and adaptation. Instruments, performance practices, notations, etc. are often adapted to new, new musical contexts. For example, blues musicians from the southern U.S. exchanged acoustic guitars for electric ones once they moved to urban settings in the northern U.S. Such transmission of musical artifacts or techniques often results in the creation of new and interesting musical styles. Use versus function. 
there's a difference between how music is used versus its function or purpose. Use suggests its role in a descriptive manner. For instance, Edward Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance as an entrance music for a graduation ceremony. Function addresses its purpose in an interpretive manner. For instance, Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance creates a formal atmosphere to heighten the importance of the student's achievement. The former can be considered a more objective account of the music, while the latter tends toward more of an interpretive or subjective analysis of a music's purpose. Spirituality and epics, ethics. An interesting aspect of world music is its use in a religious ritual. Many traditions use music as a means of transcending the material plane of existence to access the spiritual plane. World music often plays a role in spiritual activity. So, ethnomusicologists frequently find themselves observing and participating in worship ceremonies in order to better understand the cultural meaning behind a music. Modernism versus postmodernism. Modernists deal with facts, while postmodernists, for the most part, deal with meaning and truth. The former is highly descriptive, while the latter places greater value on interpretation. The current trend in ethnomusicology and other cultural disciplines is toward postmodernist interpretation of music and its meaning. Music is a cultural creation. It occurs in a variety of contexts, such as a graduation ceremony, football game, concert, as well as through the media, for instance. What role does the music play in these instances? The focus is the sound is one focus, but the purpose or meaning of the sound is also a primary element to achieving a greater understanding of music and culture. Insider outsider perspectives. Music often has meanings that are different for an insider of a tradition than that of an outsider. Both are beneficial for gaining a greater understanding of the music and its meaning. While these perspectives do complement e each other, they can also be at odds. A musical sound may not be music at all from the perspective of an insider, while an outsider may have difficulty accepting a tradition based on its spiritual associations, such as with spirit possession ceremonies. In chapter one, they discuss how a national anthem has different meanings for an insider of a culture than for a non-native, the detachment of an outsider has the detachment an outsider has can help identify aspects of a tradition that an insider takes for granted again the insights gained from both perspectives are valuable and complementary but i should say as a student in this class of world music it is important as you as an outsider to work toward understanding the insider's perspective Value systems and hierarchies. Cultural biases are unavoidable, as I've said earlier. Acknowledging them is important to avoid placing unfair judgments on the value of a music or stigmatizing it in relation to other music. While comparisons are useful for better understanding a tradition, be mindful of regarding the music on its own terms, in its own context, and not according to an unrelated value system of yours. Using a value system that you know well to better understand another music is okay, but using it to judge another as greater or lesser according to an arbitrary hierarchy falls squarely into, into the ugliest interpretations of ethnocentrism. Identity. Music is a primary means of expressing individual and social identities. What does music say about your cultural milieu and individual experiences? This is a question that can be answered in a multitude of ways and certainly one I encourage you to think about more deeply. As we go through the course, we're primarily dealing with how music relates to social identity as we are speaking in generalizations about most of these traditions. The inside look sections within the book, however, give you a better sense of the role a music plays in the expression of one's individual identity. You may consider writing your own inside look essay to contemplate how music is integral to your own life and individuality. 
Before we go on, I just want to say a few words about myself. Uh, I'm born and raised in South LA and Southeast LA. Um, I consider Bell Gardens, California, my hometown. I went to Bell Gardens Elementary, Bell Gardens Intermediate, and Bell Gardens High School. And from there, I took two years at Caltech to study physics before switching to my first love, music. Uh, I graduated with a degree in composition and piano from Cal State Long Beach, and then took a few years of just performing out in the world before I decided that world music or ethnomusicology was really my really the thing that was most exciting and most motivating for me. I got my master's degree and PhD at UCLA, which has one of the largest ethnomusicology schools in the world. Um, I grew up playing mostly keyboards. Uh, I started playing organ probably when I was around three or four years old, little battery operated organ with colored keys. I graduated to a Magnus chord organ, which had numbers, Five six five three five six five three nine nine seven. You know the rest of it. Um, and then finally, when I was about twelve years old, my parents um, could afford to buy me a classical piano. This big upright behemoth that I still have in my office. If you want to come take a look, um, I took piano lessons for about three or four years when I was in middle school and high school, and literally, I was so obsessed that I practiced eight hours a day, even during school. I'd practice two hours in the morning, come back home, practice for about six hours, then do my homework. Uh, you get pretty good when you practice eight hours a day for three or four years straight. Um, but I realized when I was in uh, undergraduate school that my, 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 my goal was not to become a classical pianist. There were so many amazing pianists better than myself. Um, I dabbled in pop music ever since I was 16. I had a band in high school when I was 16 playing uh, original rock music, and I've been in original groups ever since playing um, various combinations of rock, pop, reggae, uh, eventually moving into blues, salsa. At one point I was playing accordion in an Albanian band. Uh, I played in bluegrass bands playing mandolin. Uh, I've played in orchestras and concert bands playing uh, classical percussion and I dabble not very well I have to admit in jazz piano. Um, when I became interested in studying ethnomusicology Africa was by far the country the continent I should say that I was most interested in. Um, in my 20s I went and studied uh, the 21 string uh, harp, harp lute that we're going to study later on called the Kora um, in Senegal and uh, soon after I went to Zimbabwe and ever since then I focused on music from Zimbabwe in my own um, in my own personal life it's it's really the the world music besides classical piano that that most excites me and most turns me on uh, I play Mbira and I have my own uh, Zimbabwean marimba band. Uh, I've also studied in Ghana, traditional drumming and dance. I've studied taiko in Japan. Um, I teach Indo Indonesian gamelan, and uh, I've even conducted a gospel choir at some point. So hopefully in the course of this class, uh, we'll get to get our hands on many of these different traditions so you can experience them hands on as well. Uh, it really makes a big difference toward uh, the memories that you take away from this class and the enjoyment you're going to get from this class. A few words on how to do well in this class. And a lot of these things are, are, are sort of things that I think every professor should discuss with you when you first start taking their class because every professor has different preferences and different biases and different ways that they look at students and what they want to impart to students. Uh, for the most part, I think all of us teachers are trying to teach you all how to be better people, irrespective of what musical tradition or even what subject they're teaching you. Um, for me, I try to be very organized and have everything you need on Canvas. Uh, so follow the calendar there. It'll tell you what you need to be doing week to week 
and I hope you're always a little bit ahead, ahead of schedule. By all means, listen to the music and I hope you enjoy it. Um, I hope you enjoy it not only uh, for itself, but hopefully you'll take away some new musical preferences that will be new musical loves throughout your lifetime from this class. Um, I am about as far as you can be from a procrastinator. And I know that there are a lot of procrastinators in the world. Um, if you're a procrastinator, you might not do well in this class. Uh, I like to reward people for doing work early. So if you do your work early, most likely you're gonna get extra credit or feedback from me so that you can do it correctly, which even doubly and triply helps you to get a good grade. Uh, if you turn something in at the last minute, uh, you don't have that benefit of getting feedback from me. Um, and on top of that, you might lose points for turning in things late. Um, most importantly, communicate with me. Um, I always love it when students meet with me, uh, whether it's on Zoom or coming by to my office when possible. And it's really important that if you're having any issue whatsoever that you ask for help. That's why I'm here. Um, I check my email. I don't want to exaggerate 20, 30, 40 times a day. Uh, so email me, most likely you'll receive uh, a response within minutes rather than days or hours. Um, all communication and all work is turned in via email. So nothing is turned in via Canvas in this class. Uh, Canvas is there as a repository for your listening examples and materials you need, such as your syllabus and the calendar and instructions on how to do assignments. Uh, but please don't turn in work on Canvas and don't even send me an email on Canvas. It's just faster for me to just go straight to email and use that as the way to manage uh, my communication with you. Uh, going through Canvas makes me open up another platform and I'd rather just um, talk to you, uh, message you, and uh, take a look at your work through regular email. Um, let me see what else. Oh, okay. I told you a little bit about my Zimbabwean marimba band. If you're interested in what I do outside of the classroom, uh, I have a group called Masanga Marimba. Now, many semesters I will teach a class called African Music Ensemble. I started this class when I first became a professor at CSUN in the year 2000. I had freshly come back from Zimbabwe where I'd spent about a year learning this music and I was so excited about it that I started a class. Uh, some of the students in that very first class that you see pictured, um, you see my band there uh, in the photo, some of the students in the very first class in, in the year 2000 and 2001 and 2002 are still with me. But every single one of the members of this band are graduates of the CSUN music program. So it is very much uh, not only a band, but a family composed of uh, students uh, associated with CSUN. Um, if you want to find out more about my group, go to www.masanga.com or go to YouTube. And uh, I would suggest uh, you know, Waka Waka is a, is a good introduction to what my band does. Uh, I hope you'll be pleased and just interested in, in seeing the other side of what I do as a professor. Finally, if you find yourself wanting to learn more about world music, I encourage you to investigate some of the suggestions found on this page. Uh, our Oviat library has a paper copy as well as an online copy of the Garland Encyclopedias of World Music. It's a nine or ten volume uh, encyclopedia that has information on every musical tradition in the world. You can also access online the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians. Uh, I will teach you how to do that if you're not sure how to do that in one of our future classes. Also, as you well know, there's so many wonderful videos on YouTube these days of music from around the world. You can easily just get lost a whole afternoon just uh, spending time finding out about uh, interesting musical traditions that you may not be aware of before. 
as far as websites and audio, I highly recommend that you go to the Smithsonian's Folkways website. Um, there are a wealth of audio examples as well as films on that website, much of which is free. And if you want to get really serious about ethnomusicology, uh, the journal of the Society of Ethnomusicology called Ethnomusicology has been publishing articles about musical traditions ever since 1955. Uh, you can find out a lot more by um, sending me an email if you have any specific questions. Uh, have a great week. Thanks for listening.